here is the I'm trying to remember the page here. Page eleven. Eleven, that's right. Page eleven. I have my bookmark in there, and then I loaned it to someone. And, um, so page eleven will be our notes. But not that extensive. The Holy Spirit, our chief change agent, agent of change. <coughs> I'm so excited to see all the people that are interested in counseling, taking the Word of God and using it to help change people's lives. The Word of God is powerful as it is used by the Holy Spirit to, uh, to change people. And I am not an official certified named counselor. I desire to be, and I, uh, I'm on the road to it. But I have seen firsthand what this counseling can do because Daryl and Janet Gustafson are members of our church and they, I've watched them go through the training, kind of like from kindergarten to their graduate degrees in college in the world of nuthetic counseling. And it really became clear to me one day when... Janet was in the office. This, this was at least 15 years ago. And she was a part-time church secretary at our church. And I said, Janet, I have a lot of important studying to do. I, I can't take any calls right now. So if anyone calls, would you please just you know, get a name and number. I'll call them back. Well, her office was right next door to mine. I had the door open. And so I'm, I'm studying, reading, and the phone rings. So she answers it. Hello, Grace Covenant Church. <clears throat> and I'm trying to focus on my, my studies until I hear what she said. And then I was totally distracted for the rest <laughs> of the conversation. <laughs> the next thing she said was, do you have the gun with you right now? <laughs> and... A distraught husband had called our church wanting to speak to me because he was ready to commit suicide. And Janet goes from church secretary to pathetic counselor like that. And she literally talks this man down. And by the end of the conversation, she had one of our deacons on the way to his house to pick up the gun, she had already talked him into emptying the bullets out of the gun and had made an appointment for him and his uh, wife to come in for counseling uh, later that day. And uh, from that point on, I, I was sold on biblical counseling because <laughs> I thought, what if I answered the phone myself? I could never have done the, the kind of job that Janet did. So... Uh, from that point on, it became a joke in our church that um, I, I do a lot of counseling, but all the hard cases I give to the church. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's open with a word of prayer. We'll ask the Lord's help this evening. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together. We thank you that you have not left us without hope, without direction in the dark. That the God who proclaimed, let light shine out of darkness, has commanded his light to shine in our hearts. We might have the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit that has renewed our hearts and has opened our eyes and has enabled us to see the truth and has moved us to believe in Christ alone for our salvation and has inspired and motivated us to repent. We thank you for the tools that we have to walk with you in obedience and to help others to point them to the way and the truth and the life, even Christ Jesus. We pray your blessing upon our time together this evening. We ask that you'd come now, Lord, by the power of your Spirit and work in our hearts and lives. For we ask all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> well, how many NAIC counselors does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Just one. But the light bulb must be willing to change. <laughs> of course, we could say at this point that the Holy Spirit must work that change in said light bulb. And there is a danger when counseling people to have a tendency to get so engrossed in our work, our homework, or their homework, or our studies, that we overlook the Holy Spirit in the counseling process, that we forget about the Holy Spirit. Uh, it can happen that we get so caught up, perhaps, in the problems of the counselees and their needs that we forget to leave room for the Holy Spirit to work. Before God converted me, I used to be a real estate salesman. And the emphasis was on salesmen. And when I was converted and then later became a pastor, my wife was constantly having to correct me about selling people. Because I would, I would be so persuasive to convince them and to give them these five arguments why and reasons why uh, they needed to do this. And by the end of the day, I had sold them uh, on Christianity, but didn't leave any room for the Holy Spirit to, uh, to work. So sometimes we need to get out of the way, to give space for the Spirit to work in people's hearts. Either way, we need to see and appreciate the role of the Holy Spirit in the biblical counseling process. And we know that God ultimately works all things in accordance with His will. Yet we're responsible to God to obey Him and to diligently serve Him, to follow Him. So while God is sovereign over all things, we are held responsible for our actions. And this is addressed in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. These are two wonderful verses that set side by side the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So as we'll see, God is the one who works in our lives, and he does this by the power of the Holy Spirit. Also, we need to allow God to work through our lives, by the power of His Holy Spirit. He, we want Him to work His power through our lives. So I hope to show you tonight just how dependent we are upon the Holy Spirit to change our lives and to change others, other lives, all for the glory of God. So by way of introduction, I'd like to set before you some preliminary truths about the Holy Spirit. I want to just take you on a crash course through the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because of the three persons of the Godhead, often the Holy Spirit gets the least amount of attention. And that's certainly by design because Jesus said that He will bring glory to me. So the Holy Spirit is, is not uh, by design one who puts Himself in center stage and in the limelight. But it's important to take the Word of God and, and to see what it teaches about the Holy Spirit. Okay. And um, first thing I want you to understand is that the Holy Spirit is a person. The person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's seen uh, in uh, various places and based on various reasons why we can assert the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because no one's going to disagree or argue uh, unless we have some uh, Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or other cultists uh, present. Uh, the Holy Spirit acts as a person in John 14, uh, verses 16 and 17. The, Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit as abiding or dwelling with his disciples. And let me read that to you in John 14, 16, and 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give
give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Holy Spirit uh, then will be teaching and bringing things to the remembrance of the disciples, also in John 14, verse 26. Jesus says, uh, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So, it, it would be like they would have photographic memories when it, when it came to the things that Jesus said to them. The Holy Spirit would bring to their remembrance. Uh, in chapter 15, in verse 26, the Spirit testifies or bears witness regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 16, and verse 8, the Spirit convicts the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit guides, speaks, discloses, glorifies in John 16, 13, and 14. So, an impersonal force or power cannot do these kind of things that the Holy Spirit has been attributed to doing. And elsewhere in Scripture we find the Holy Spirit teaching, witnessing, speaking, calling to ministry, sending out missionaries, uh, forbidding Paul from entering into certain regions or forbidding certain actions, sanctifying, revealing, searching, and knowing. The Holy Spirit performs all these actions and more, which can only be done by a real person. So that's the personhood of the Spirit. The characteristics of the Spirit also help point to personality. Some of the characteristics and acts uh, chapter 5, you know that account of Ananias and Sapphira? In Acts 5, verse 3, and then again in verse 9, Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? And then in verse 9, Peter says, how is it that you have agreed together, that is, with your husband, to test the Spirit of the Lord? And what Peter goes on to, to, to show is that they have not uh, lied just to men, they have lied to God. And the Holy Spirit is one who was lied to. You can't lie to an impersonal force or some impersonal power. In Acts 7, and verse 51, it speaks of resisting the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, verse 30, Paul speaks of grieving the Holy Spirit. Jesus talks in Matthew 12, 31, of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That is often understood to be the, the unpardonable sin. Uh, and it only makes sense if it is against the person a person of such magnitude as one who is, in fact, God. <clears throat> so how could people do all these things to the Holy Spirit unless the Holy Spirit was a real person? Could the apostles have said in Acts 15, 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us? The Spirit was just an impersonal power or a mere force or something like electricity? In the Great Commission, Jesus commands us to baptize disciples in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If both the Father and the Son are persons, how could these two persons share the same name, singular, with the Holy Spirit? So it's the name, singular, of these three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit refers to himself as a person. In Acts 10, uh, verses 19 and 20, it says, And while Peter was pondering 
the vision. This was where he was at, the home of Simon the Tanner. He was up on the roof. The sheet was let down from heaven with all kinds of four-footed creatures. And while he was pondering this vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise, go down, and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. In Acts 13, 2 says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So, you, you can know the personal pronoun I in these texts. Yeah. I have sent them. Uh, set apart for me for the work that I have called them to. So it should be obvious that impersonal forces don't speak with these kind of personal pronouns. Uh, one other thing that is uh, of interest is that the male gender is, is referred to with the Holy Spirit. Even though he is a spirit, male gender is attributed in 1 Corinthians 12.11 says, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He wills. So the Holy Spirit is a He. Christ is a He. God the Father is a He. I'm not trying to be you know, some kind of a discriminatory uh, person. Uh, that's just how God has designed it. Before the, God created male and female, there was the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit in eternal union. So we see the Holy Spirit and His person. It's also important to just underline the divinity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called God. In Acts 5.3, we, we alluded to that. <clears throat> Peter said uh, that Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, he said, you have lied to God. So to lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God. The Holy Spirit is God. Divine attributes are also attributed to the Holy Spirit. The, uh, we know that only God is eternal, yet Hebrews 9.14 calls the Holy Spirit eternal. Only God is omnipresent, Yet, Psalm 139, 7-10, shows that the Spirit is omnipresent. Only God is omniscient. And yet, Isaiah 40, 13 and 14, shows that the Spirit is all-knowing. And only God is sovereign. But that text in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, shows that the Spirit does as He pleases. The Spirit is sovereign. <clears throat> And then the works of creation are credited to the Holy Spirit, even though uh, we know only God can create, only God can give life. Job 26.13 and Job 33.4 and Psalm 104.30 all teach the Holy Spirit gives life. <coughs> the Spirit of the Lord has created me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. So let's just, let me just go on and, and mention the work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> that brings us closer to home in terms of counseling. Uh, the work that the Holy Spirit does is that of empowering or giving life. Life in the first place. We call that generation. The Holy Spirit brings life. And Jesus was conceived by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit sustains human life. He preserves human life. He keeps our heart beating. He enables us to take our next breath. He gives then spiritual life. First physical life, then for the believer, spiritual life. Regeneration. First there's generation, then regeneration. And, and then, the day will come when he will give new physical life. 
for new resurrection bodies. So we would call that what? Glorification. Glorification, Romans 8, 11. The Holy Spirit gives power for special service. Uh, even um, uh, Bezalel, who was the art, artist in putting together the tabernacle, he was given skill in craftsmanship by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. For those of you who have certain careers or certain gifts, skills, uh, you, you show a perhaps a natural ability, you give the credit to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit purifies His people through the process of sanctification. And He reveals His truth to the apostles, to the prophets, by inspiration. He unifies the saints and He gives stronger or weaker evidence of God's presence according to our response to Him, so our assurance the salvation is dependent upon the Holy Spirit. At uh, regeneration, we are baptized by the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, uh, Paul says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1, 13, uh, the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. He pours God's love into our hearts. He baptizes us into one body. He gives assurance. He speaks truth to our spirit. I love Romans 8.16. The spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. <clears throat> he gives us wisdom, comfort, freedom, righteousness, hope. He grants an awareness of our sonship or adoption and even of the glory to come. Uh, so, the Holy Spirit illumines the Word of God. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, can relate to times that you have read the Word of God and got very little out of it, and other times that you've looked at perhaps a text that you've read numerous times before, and suddenly new truths just jump off the page. The illumination of the Holy Spirit. Pray, open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things in your law. And the Holy Spirit is the one who will give us that illumination, that guidance. All Christian ministry has to be done with a dependence on the power, the influence of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do ministry without the Spirit of God. Zechariah 4, 6 says, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So we can't even take our next breath apart from the Holy Spirit. So why would we expect to see biblical change mm -hmm. in the lives of those who are seeking the help and counsel without the Spirit's help? We need the Holy Spirit. But in our reliance upon the Holy Spirit's help, we must realize that the Holy Spirit's main ministry is to bring glory to Christ. The Spirit is, in a sense, constantly pointing away from Himself to Christ, much like John the Baptist, whose theme of, of his ministry was, He must increase, I must decrease. He will become greater, I'll become uh, lesser. So, uh, Jesus said it in John 16, 13 and 14, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, said Jesus, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. So that helps give us guidance in our counsel when we seek to minister the Word of God. We want to glorify Christ. Uh, that's so important because in some counseling situations, your counselee can become very dependent on you. Or suddenly you're, you're getting calls in the middle of the night, 
oh, we just had this fight, what should I do? Uh, you, they're, they're leaning on you far too much than they should, and it, uh, they're becoming dependent on you rather than on the Lord. And, and so you have to make sure that that doesn't happen. And if you sense that is happening, take definite steps to get them back leaning upon the Lord, upon His Word, and upon the Holy Spirit. So, the primary sign of the Spirit's presence, of the Spirit's work, will be seen when much is being made of Jesus Christ. So, when people that you're dealing with, or even in your own life, when you sense that Christ is growing increasingly precious to others or to yourself, when you find that you love Him more and more, when you want to please Him, obey Him, uh, follow Him, follow His example, be conformed to His image, uh, then, you can, then you can know that the Holy Spirit is at work there. So a lot of times people may not sense the Spirit at work in their lives. The Holy Spirit's okay with that. But you will you will sense it in terms of cause and effect. You know the effect is Christ is being elevated, uh, repentance is being seen, uh, faith is growing, and you can trace it back to the cause, and that's the Holy Spirit. In First John chapter four, verse two and three, it says, "By this you know the Spirit of God." Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, whom you have heard was coming and is now in the world already. So when the Holy Spirit is present, he'll exalt Jesus. He'll put Jesus forward as the one who has come in the flesh. And we need to make sure that we put them forward in our counseling as well. It was David Paulinson who said in his book, Speaking the Truth in Love, all of us tend to think of counseling as a human-to-human -human interaction. But in fact, a human-with-savior interaction must come first. If my counseling does not help others to rely upon another who is the Savior upon whom I'm relying, I will invariably teach them to rely on themselves or on me or other friends or medications or fill in the blank, any other substitute. So it's Jesus who works by the Spirit, His Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to bring about change in human life. And biblical counseling worthy of the name is a ministry of God's own power in the gospel, changing people inwardly and outwardly. We are uh, doing a building expansion project right now in Gilbert, Arizona at our church. And we completed. Uh, we don't have quite enough money to finish the whole project, but we worked hard to get a roof over it, to get it all shingled, to get the plywood up with the OSB, and then to put the siding, the windows are in, and then it's being painted. So from the outside, it looks all complete. But as soon as you come in, there's all these exposed studs, uh, concrete floors, you can see through the attic, the rafters, the ins uh, hardly anything has been done to the inside. And I thought, that's an amazing analogy of how some people's lives can look. On the outside, they look all painted and complete to, to you know, the usual passerby who drives <laughs> down the street. It looks finished and pretty. But if we could go inside the doors of the, their own building, we might see a different picture and it's, uh, it's incomplete. Uh, the, the work of the Spirit happens the other way around. It starts with the inside and it and goes outside. It, it begins with the heart. So all lasting change has to occur inwardly. Okay? And 
according to our statement. That's my introduction, by the way. <laughs> It, the, the work of the Spirit is a radical change. It's a change of heart. <clears throat> it says here, from death to life. And you could put next to that the word regeneration. That's the biblical systematic uh, term. Regeneration means to be born again. The Bible clearly teaches that all people are dead and trespass in sin. And that is why we must be born again. Jesus said that. It was George Whitfield that was one of the things that he was famous for preaching in terms of the doctrine of regeneration. And in fact, one man who uh, heard him preach on numerous occasions went up to him and said, why is it you keep preaching that we must be born again? And his answer was, because you must be born again. So we're born first in this world physically. We're dead in yeah. sin. And that is why we must be born again. And you know, in the book of Revelation, it says that those who were cast into the lake of fire, that was the second death. And I think it was D.L. Moody who said, if a man is only born once, he will die twice. That was He'll experience the second death. But if a man is born twice, he will only die once. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So, because of spiritual death, that also brings to mind the doctrine of total inability. We are unable to make ourselves alive if we are dead. I mean, that certainly stands to reason from the physical, natural realm. A dead person cannot make themselves alive again. There must be some change or power external to that person that must come upon them. Uh, maybe the paddles, you know, from... Uh, what do you call it, the fibrillator? Yeah, to bring them back. Um, and, and so that's what Jesus is referring to about being born again or regenerated. It's the Holy Spirit coming, uh, the spiritual defibrillator, and, uh, and bringing one who is dead in trespass and sin to life for the first time. For the first time. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is important because biblical counseling uh, really falls into two camps, doesn't it? If someone comes to, to seek help from you, uh, you discern that they are still dead in sin, your counseling will take the form of what? Evangelism. Evangelism. <laughs> exactly. If they are born again, if they are a Christian, your counseling then takes the form of what? Discipleship. Discipleship. One theologian named Bruce Ware in, in his book on the Trinity says the Spirit awakens our dead hearts and opens our blind eyes to see Jesus. And amazingly, and the Spirit works in our hearts to bring us to salvation. His purpose is to show us the beauty and glory of Jesus. Not Himself. His goal is to open our eyes to behold the wonder of Jesus. So what do you think about Jesus? Is He the fairest of 10,000 in your life? Is He uh, the most wonderful counselor? Uh, the, the greatest person you've known, all true change of heart uh, will uh, show that. It will uh, happen as the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us. And it, it happens uh, in different stages, in different ways, different degrees, but it always happens in the sense that the Holy Spirit brings a dead sinner t to life, to repentance, to faith, to the cross of Christ. The, the Christian 
counselor brings the word of God, uh, the Holy Spirit uses that word you know, upon the heart to bring life. So this is a radical change. It's a change of heart. Also, it's a change of mind. Right? Is that what the change of mind is from the numeral two? From darkness to light. And you can put in parentheses the word faith. Did you know that sin affects the mind? <laughs> Why is there mental illness in the world? Because of sin. Yeah. Uh, we, we did look at that passage in Romans chapter 1 this evening. Keith Palmer called our attention to, to that. and He mentioned a term, uh, I don't know if you caught it or not, the noetic effects of sin. Uh, noetic is uh, from the Greek word nous for mind. So it's the mental effects, or the sin has the effects upon the mind. In Romans 1, 21 and 22, Paul says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their, what? Thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Okay. Ephesians, if you turn there and look at chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, we also see the noetic effects. And noetic is N-O-E-T-I-C if, if you're Want to write that down. N-O-E-T-I-C. The noetic effects of sin. <clears throat> and in the Ephesians 1, 16 through 19, Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation, and the knowledge of Him. See, that's, that's noetic there. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. See, in Romans 1, he talked about their hearts were darkened. Here, it's they're enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, and the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, etc., etc. Then just turn to chapter 4 here in Ephesians, look at verse 17 and 18. <clears throat> Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. And how are, how are they walking? In the futility of their minds. Verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding. We often use the, the, the term, the lights are on but no one's home. Mm -hmm. The lights aren't even on. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. So, ignorance doesn't lead to hardness of heart. Hardness of heart leads to ignorance. It's a reciprocal thing. Just as Augustine said, I do not want to understand in order to believe, I believe in order that I might understand. It's the heart leading to the understanding. Can you, can you quote that again? I do not under, I do not want to understand in order that I may believe. I believe in order that I may understand. So the, the change that accompanies the second birth affects our thinking, our perspective, and that our whole orientation is redirected. Uh, so this is where the lights begin to come on. And it's a beautiful thing to, to see in the eyes of someone you're talking to, you're counseling, and suddenly they're tracking with you. They, they're, they're, they're beginning... They're beginning to get it. it. It may be slow at first. There might be a flicker uh, behind the pupils of their eyes. Uh, 
but they, they begin to, to see something. Uh, sometimes it, it might be radical. There's the V8 moment where it's like, aha, I get it. Or they go, oh, that's why. Or that's how. You know, uh, what an illustration we have from Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. <laughs> that was his V8 moment. <laughs> that was two V8 moments. Yeah, that was probably a V8, a V16 moment, right? Yeah. Uh, at this point, though, what was he doing? He was ravaging the church in his zeal to persecute Christians until Jesus met him on the road and the light blinded him physically. Right? He had something like scales that later fell off his eyes. But now he came to see Jesus as the Messiah spiritually for the first time. So he could see, but then he was blinded that he might spiritually see the truth. Yeah. In Acts 26, 16 and through 18, Paul later gives the account of, uh, of this experience. He tells what happens what happened on the road to Damascus as he is speaking here. Let me read that to you, verse 16. He says, I, I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. So you have seen me, will appear, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. And look at verse 18. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of, God, of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is where people begin to see with new eyes. In fact, that's a book by David Paulinson, uh, Seeing Through New Eyes. Okay. So this radical change of the Holy Spirit will affect the heart, first the heart, regeneration, but it affects the mind. And then also we see there will be a radical change of the will. That's on the next page here. Roman numeral three. It's a change from rebellion to submission and disobedience to obedience. <clears throat> okay, so this is where what is happening inside now begins to leach out come to the outside, begin to see the, the, the change in their behavior, the outward behavior, the unwilling person uh, is unconverted. When God changes them, uh, then they go from unwilling to willing. Jesus cried out in Matthew 23, 37, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children as the hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. One of the important passages that we're all familiar with, perhaps, is 1 Corinthians 2.14, where Paul speaks of the unconverted person the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. For they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. There's no such thing as free will. When the believer is filled with the Holy Spirit, they are then led by the Spirit to walk in obedience to the Word of God. Before they were unwilling, the Spirit changes their will. 
uh, a great text is Romans 6, 17. Paul says, But thanks be to God that though you once were slaves to sin, you have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Well, how do they become committed? Spirit of God changing them, moving in them. So it's a, it's a change of life from childhood to manhood. And, um, or, yeah, that's the next one. Change of life from, from childhood to manhood. Roman numeral uh, four. And we could put in parentheses the word growth. Growth. It's progressive. This is progressive sanctification. The Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in us. And he's helping us to put off the old man and to put on the new one. And that's Ephesians 5, 20 through 24. The Holy Spirit helps us to grow and to mature in, in the faith over time. So there, there should be a ripening of the fruit in our lives. As we persevere in confidence, uh, so I can get assurance, so I can give comfort to them, but I need to listen so I can help grasp what is at the heart of their struggle. So we, we need the Holy Spirit's help for listening. We need the Holy Spirit's help when we are counseling. Uh, we need to, to do that, I think, first of all, to be good data gatherers. Okay? Um, biblical counseling is geared toward helping people solve their problems, but in order to do this, we, we need to know what's really at the, the root of, of their problem. And a lot of times, people, they don't, they don't know. Right? They don't tell you what the symptoms are. Oh, we don't get along. We're always fighting. That's the problem, they'll say. Well, maybe, maybe this, uh, we, we learned tonight that really there's a deeper problem. It's a problem of idolatry. It's a problem of worship. It's a problem of the heart. The, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart, is what we say. Proverbs 18.15 says, An intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. We have to be good detectives. Spiritual Sherlock Holmes here. Proverbs 20, verse 5. The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Proverbs 25, 2. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search them out. And the Holy Spirit knows what's in the heart of people, all people. You know, the inner secrets are like an open book to the Spirit of God. And He can, your Father, forgive your trespasses. Well, as He read that, He, he could see the wife just tighten up, stiffen up. She had this frown on. Uh, he could tell she was, she was not happy with what He read and what He was implying. She understood what He was saying. She did not like it. And, and so the, the session ended, and she, she left in a, a bad mood. And Daryl thought, oh boy, I won't see them again. Even though they made the appointment for the next week, same time, same place, he really wasn't sure what was, how that was going to happen. Well, the next week came, the hour for the counseling came, the door opens, the husband and wife are walking in holding hands. She has this beautiful countenance and smile upon her face. It was the Word of God, by the Spirit of God. It, it, throughout that week, she thought about it as the Holy Spirit began to put it into her heart. She found the help, the assistance by the Spirit to forgive. And when she forgave, 